Feel free to ask me any questions if you have them. Uh, we do have your test today at lab time. Hopefully everybody got my email earlier saying that you don't have to actually go into lab to take it. Looks like no one's emailed me since then. We've got about three minutes. Feel free to ask me if you have any questions. I'm just ramping up, preparing for class. Got about one more minute if anybody has any last minute questions before we start class. Now will be the time. All right, so we now got about 10 of you folks in there. Does anyone have any questions before we get started? Darnisha, did you have something you want to say? All right, well, we are jumping into Chapter 10, which is called Rotational Motion. So uh, I mentioned to you before that we were trying to ultimately be able to solve you know physics problems and so far what we've been doing is treating all objects like point particles or point objects and uh what that allows us to do basically is to solve for the motion of the center of mass of any system so if we're talking about you know for instance a car we're pretty much making the trajectories of cars or trajectories of the center of mass of a ball or the trajectory of the car will actually be the tra trajectory of the center of mass of the car. Of course, if the car were to, for instance, get in a wreck, uh, it's going to spin and twirl and all sorts of stuff like that. We can't address that. 
So uh, ultimately, what we would like to be able to do is be able to address all those problems. So in order to do so, we need to understand uh, how things then could possibly rotate. So for instance, we'll initially consider bodies, and I say initially, it's actually all we'll do in this entire course, is we'll assume bodies are essentially rigid. Uh, and what that means is if you had like a uh, atom or molecule right here and an atom or molecule right here, then that distance between them is always going to be the same. That's that's a part of it being a, what we call a rigid body is it's not going to stretch or expand. But another part is also that if you had that atom and that atom or molecule there and a third atom or molecule then you can sort of make a line connecting these two and then a line connecting these two. The angle between them won't change either. So, uh, for instance, if you if you have, let's say, my cool, uh, <laughs> my Baby Yoda rock, okay, that means when I rotate Baby Yoda, his uh, left ear, for instance, is always going to stay to the left of his left eye, and that's going to be to the left of his right eye, and to the right of his right eye would be his right ear. And just because I rotated this way doesn't mean that that orientation is going to change, and it won't. It's not going to change. Uh, so you can also see that, for instance, if this thing, let's say, about the center, if this eye moves about 30 degrees like it did there, the whole rock moved about 30 degrees. So that's sort of what we're looking at is our ideal of a, uh, idea of a rigid body. And uh, that's what we'd like to be able to study in general. So we could basically use the physics that we've learned about, you know, point particles and say, okay, well, this is what the center, what the center of mass is going to do. And then we'd say, okay, well, if I understand rotation enough, then I can also say, well, given the initial conditions that it was spinning and it was in such and such an angle or orientation when I left it and stuff like that, you are not hearing me? Oh, uh, let me see if I am. It doesn't say I'm muted. Okay, so y'all are hearing me too. Cool. Josh, is everything okay? You might not be hearing me. Uh, you might want to have to log out and log back in. I don't know. Good thing is all this will be on video, so if you miss anything, you can catch back. And, you know, I talk a lot anyway, so you'll be golden. <laughs> so anyways, uh, if we know the initial orientation, in other words, like we could set up a coordinate system and call, you know, some specific angle to some specific part uh, that we can easily identify and re-identify and re-identify. We could say that angle is initially 15 degrees, 13.8 degrees or whatever. We can say that the initial angular velocity has a certain you know radians per second or meters per second. And then at some point later, uh, knowing all the forces and torques that are acting on it, we can then figure out what the orientation of the object will be later. So we can completely describe something. So I could literally say, uh, with, with enough practice to make sure my skills are proper, uh, I could actually take like a pin or a horseshoe stake or something like that, and I could toss it appropriately uh, according to the way that I practice. And... Uh, if I'm good enough to consistently do it that way, then you know the initial angle at which the uh, horseshoe stake or pin is oriented, and you know the angular speed with which it'll uh, be thrown. And you also probably have some sense, if I've really practiced it enough, of exactly how fast I've thrown it, so you can figure out what the center of mass is doing, as well as what the rotation is doing, so that you could predict uh, with a fairly high degree of accuracy, not only you know how high it goes, how fast it's, it will go, uh, what will be its max height, what will be the distance it travels, but what part of the rod would actually uh, hit the ground first and, and what orientation the rod would be in when that part hit the ground, all that good stuff. So that's really what we're shooting for. And in order to understand that, we need to know rotational motion. So I, I will tell you that there's a lot of this we don't have to go over specifically because it turns out the equations of rotation, uh, at least from a kinematic standpoint, are essentially the same as the equations for uh, linear motion. And dynamically, they're very similar as well. So let me start off by uh, giving you some pertinent information to rotation. So uh, feel free to ask questions as we go along. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Or attempt to share my screen. 
and try not to yawn for some reason. I don't know why I'm yawning. Yeah. I mean, I know why. Obviously, I'm tired, but I don't know why I'm tired because I ain't done anything. Well, I guess I did do some stuff. I stayed up late and all that good stuff, but here we go. So that should pop up any second now. Any second. There you go, finally. Okay. So for starters, what we really need to make sense of uh, before we can really make a connection between the equations of linear kinematics and the equations of rotational kinematics, uh, really we need something that links the two. And the thing that links the two is something you learned in, in trig. Yeah. And that is the idea that if I draw a circle of radius R, say, okay, and then this is a line, and let's say we're going to sweep out uh, angle theta, then this angle right here could be called theta. The length of this line and therefore the length of that line would be called R. And what we know of is that there's a relationship between the arc length that is spanned by, uh, by that angle such that S, the arc length, is equal to R times theta, where this is the definition of radians, but the specific thing is the theta must be measured in radians. And any equation that that use that uses that equation would also have to add the theta and radians. So you got to be careful with that stuff. Mm. Now, from this, you happen to know that, for instance, the distance all the way around, let's say from here all the way around to there. That distance has a very spe special name. Does anybody recall what that special name is? So I'm talking about the distance around the circle, even though I'm drawing it way far away from the circle. But that distance is called C for circumference. And that helps us because we know the formula for circumference is two pi times r. So what that tells us is theta is equal to two pi radians for theta being 360 degrees. Of course, that also means that that's the same thing as one revolution, okay? So that gives us some conversion factors as well as uh, cements the idea of S equals R times theta in our heads, hopefully. So that's one equation. Now, uh, we will start off from here and we'll say, for instance, if I wanted to define a quantity, a, a velocity, for instance, you'd say V average is delta X over delta T, of course, that becomes instantaneously, the instantaneous rate of change is dx over dt. Similarly, there is an, an idea of acceleration that is delta V over delta T is the average. And we can convert that to an instantaneous acceleration by saying A is equal to dv dt. Well, if I take s equals r times theta and take the derivative of both of those, then I get d by dt of s is equal to d by dt of r times theta, and if we make the assumption that r times theta, uh, or that r is a constant, 
then we can get this expression, which gives us ds dt is equal to r d theta dt. And notice ds dt is the distance traveled. The, the s is the distance traveled around the circle. So when you take the derivative of that with respect to time, you're getting the velocity. So this gives us, in fact, that V is equal to R times the rotational analog, which we'll call omega. So we're going to define this to be the angular velocity omega. And of course, this is already V. Similarly, we could take the derivative of both sides. We'd say D by DT of V is equal to, and I guess I'd put black in there, so I should probably stick to the black. Uh, that's going to be equal to D by DT of R times omega. And I'm not sure what I was writing way up there, but I did. So here we are. Uh, and in fact, I should have stuck with the black, but anyways, I didn't. The main thing is from this, we get A. We get A is equal to R times something we'll call alpha. Uh, because this is going to become essentially A is equal to R d omega over dt, which we're going to define as the uh, tangential acceleration. Okay, so this is the tangential uh, angular acceleration, I should say. So that's a linking between variables that we're going to talk about in rotation, namely omega and alpha, and our area of and quantities we're going to talk about in linear motion, which would be V and, and, out, uh, and A. So that is a relationship. And from this, of course, you recall that if we took the, uh, made the assumption that the acceleration was a constant, uh, then we could get some very specific equations. So I'm going to write down those equations uh, and stuff using some of the same stuff. For instance, you know that the uh, average velocity formula really gives you, of course, x is equal to x0 plus v bar t. And you know that the average acceleration equation gives you v is equal to v0 plus a bar t. But if we go on the assumption that uh, a equals a constant, OK, then we also get these other equations, x is equal to 1 half a t squared plus v0 t plus x0, and we get uh, v squared is equal to v0 squared plus 2ax minus x0. And there's another one that we don't use that often, uh, but I do on occasion, it comes in really handy. And that is that the uh, average velocity is equal to v1 plus v2 over 2. So those all come out as a result of these definitions and then, you know, integrations and stuff like that. And for instance, I, you guys should know that basically uh, you're having a comprehensive final or, or second uh, midterm today, and that stuff's still fair game. So for instance, you should be able to either differentiate uh, x as a function of t to get velocity or differentiate v as a function of t to get acceleration, or you should be able to integrate a of t to get the velocity as a function of time as long as you have at least one good initial condition. And then if you had a second good initial condition, you could integrate that to get x of t. So those are you know still things that are happening. Now, here's the neat thing. It turns out that when we go to rotational motion, uh, you can see already the similarities of how the delta x over delta t uh, is the average velocity. So that's going to turn into something like uh, omega bar is equal to delta theta over delta t, which becomes uh, the instantaneous 
situation where the instantaneous angular speed is d theta over dt. So we're actually saying theta is sort of the equivalent of our uh, x, okay? Similarly, we have alpha bar is equal to delta omega over delta t, and instantaneously, that alpha is equal to d omega over dt. So we also get, of course, uh, omega equals omega zero plus alpha t, or excuse me, plus v, uh, omega t, with a bar over it. And we also get, oops, no wonder, I, I got them mixed up uh, because I was looking at two different things at once. Let's kill that completely. <laughs> I was wondering why my brain went haywire like that. So this one's going to become theta is equal to theta zero plus omega bar T. And then this other one is going to become omega is equal to omega zero plus alpha bar T. And then if we go on the assumption that alpha equals a constant, then we can get theta equals one half alpha t squared plus omega zero t plus theta zero. And we can get omega squared is equal to omega zero squared plus two alpha theta minus theta zero. And we can also get omega bar is equal to omega one plus omega two over two. So that's just the beginnings, but you can see, yeah, clearly we're going to have some similarities. And in fact, it goes deeper than that. Uh, for instance, we've learned Newton's second law in several ways. We could say the summation of all the forces is equal to M uh, A, but you could also say the summation of all the forces is equal to m dv dt. And you can also say what we learned uh, fairly recently, the summation of the forces is equal to dp dt. Well, guess what? We can do something similar with that, only now the rotational analog to force is something we call torque. So I'm going to say the summation of the torques is equal to I times alpha. I'm leaving the vectorness off for right now, but it's essentially the same. Uh, and I'll take away that. Now that could also be written instead of something like M times A, which is what I wrote there, I times A. It could also be written the summation of the torques is equal to I times D omega over DT. So that's just like the second version. And lo and behold, the summation of the torques could equal dL dt, uh, where all of a sudden I decided to put vectors in again. <laughs> so that's the that's the angular momentum in this case. And we've introduced new quantities. For instance, this quantity is called torque. This is called moment of inertia. Uh, in statics, you'll call it something different, but it's the same, sort of the same quantity. Uh, I'll tell you that uh, when, when I actually work, like as uh, doing structural engineering calculations or stuff like that, the uh, moment of inertia had a quite a bit different uh, set of units, like inches to the fourth or something like that. And what that was, was largely they had to uh, take out the density of the material because that changes from one part, uh, one type of wood to the next, for instance, or from wood to steel. Uh, and you also, you know, had different sizes. So even that could be different. So ultimately it ended up giving us something with uh, more geometry and less density type calculations. So anyways, that's what that came out to be. And uh, this quantity right here, this quantity, just the numerator, is the angular momentum. So that's angular momentum. 
So all these neat facts are pretty cool. That's helpful. In fact, you know that P, which we used over here, is equal to M times V. Well, guess what? L over here can be written as I times omega. Uh, of course, you know, you can write P other ways. You could write it as, uh, well, you could write it as M times V, but you can also write, uh, for instance, let's see. Actually, I lost it. I was, I was thinking of something else and I, I lost it all of a sudden. But anyways, we've got all that in terms of, of things that we're familiar with. I will tell you that I, at this moment of inertia, is equal to the summation. If you have discrete countable objects, then it's equal to the summation from I equals 1 to N of M1, which would be M sub I, times r sub i squared, where r sub i is the distance from m sub i to the rotation axis. And it's got to be perpendicular to the rotation axis. So that's the case. But if you have a non-countable number of things, in other words, you cut it up into an infinity of things, then i becomes the integral of r squared dm. Uh, there's also another case, which just doesn't really match too well, but L turns out to be R cross P. So that's a, another relationship. But you can see, since these equations are all the same form, you could literally read a question from chapter 10, and everywhere it says an angular quantity, replace that with the, the analog from the linear motion, decide which equation you would use to solve that, and then choose the exact same analog equation and you would do it correctly. In other words, you get the right result by using the analogous rotational equation. So it's really that tightly uh, related. So hopefully uh, everybody understands what I'm saying here. And hopefully you should also be able to make some sense how at least when you're using V equals R omega, uh, A equals R alpha, and S equals R times theta, you definitely, definitely, definitely have to use theta in radians. Uh, the other equations, you don't necessarily have to use radians, but you can always use radians. So if you're a little apprehensive, feel free to go back and forth converting ra uh, radians and whatnot. But right now, let's, let's work on a couple examples. So for instance, uh, let's say, Consider a bicycle tire that spins through, let's say, uh, eight. Point nine revolutions. Okay. How many degrees? Oops. And radians are actually I should say this a little better yeah let me write this a little better I don't like ending sentences and uh prepositions so uh through how many degrees has it actually, sorry about that, spun. That's going to be part A and part B through how many radians. Now, I want to say something about radians real quick if you... Uh, if you want to look at this previous page, notice S equals R times theta tells you that, for instance, theta 
is actually equal to S over R. So if you take S in meters and divide it by R in meters, you're going to get no units. The units cancel out. So that means the radian is actually not really a unit. The radian measure is a pure number. Uh, that uh, gives us some freedom, for instance. It allows us to drop radians from the units when we want to. It also allows us to add radians to the units when we want to. Uh, so just keep that in mind. You'll see some examples of, of how that helps in a second. So let's do our solution. So what we have is 8.9 revolutions. Now, uh, this is part A. And 8.9 revolutions, remember, one revolution is basically a uh, complete rotation. And we know that a complete rotation is a 360 degree rotation. So I can make this over one just to make it, you know, so it's obvious that it's on the numerator so you can be e more easily dealing with the fraction that's coming. So I'll put a fraction down here and I'll try to eliminate the variable I have or the unit I have, which is the revolution. And I know that one revolution is equal to 360 degrees. So that's what I'm going to actually do. I'm going to do eight times 8.9. And the way you do this when you have this long string, as I told you guys, to multiply all the numerators, get a new numerator, multiply all the denominators, get a new denominator, and then divide the new numerator by the new denominator, and you'll have the answer. In this case, it's only two fractions, so it's not that big a deal. I'm just going to do 8.9 times 360, and uh, that gives me 3,204. 204 degrees. And with that big a number, I don't like putting a little circle on it. I'd much rather call it degrees. So that's one answer. Anybody have any questions about that? So notice the revolution canceled out with the revolution. Uh, now for part B, whoa, did he? For part B, we want to convert that to. Uh, to radians. Now, it's best to start with the data that you were given instead of using calculated quantities. So I'm not going to employ the 3,204 uh, specifically because I want to uh, eliminate, if in the event that I made some mistake there, I want to eliminate the opportunity of making another mistake, even if I do it right. Because if I do it correctly, uh, but I use the wrong number, then I'll still get the wrong answer. So it's always better to use the original quantities as many times as you can. So I'm going to take this now again, rectify it by making sure it's over one so we can see it's clearly in the numerator. And in this case, I know that one revolution is equal to a complete rotation, which we saw by the example of circumference equals 2 pi r, that one revolution would correspond to 2 pi radians. And again, this is where I just plug the number in there. I, I put the word radian in there, even though it's technically not a unit, because I'll get just a number where the revolutions cancel out. And that number just floating in space is not very meaningful. But if you see radians behind it, you know, oh, OK, he's talking about radians. So I'm going to take the uh, 8.9 and I'm going to multiply it by 2 times 3.14159, close enough. And when I do that, I get 55.92. Whoa, no. I get 55.92. And that should be radian. So here's the case again where I just write the radians down. I don't necessarily have to have it. Now, I only had two sig figs as well, so I should underline that so we know that uh, the answer should actually be called 56. But there's my answer to part B. Any questions on that? Now, just as a, you know, a reminder, uh, the units are the, let's say, conversion statements or conversion facts that are necessary is uh, one, revolution is equal to 360 degrees, but it's also equal to 2 pi radians. 
And you could also say another conversion factor that's sometimes convenient is 180 degrees over pi radians or, depending on which way you need it, pi radians over 180 degrees. Or you can say, for instance, that one radian is equal to, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take 180 and divide it by pi. So 180 divided by 3.14159 gives me one radian is equal to 57.296. And actually, uh, we could go a couple more digits with that if we wanted to, uh, because I used 3.14159. So I could actually go another decimal point. But the main thing is, as long as you have roughly what these figures are, you're good to go. So you will need these from time to time. Any questions on that? Okay, so here's another example. And this is a neat example because it uh, is something that we do a lot of in science. Uh, I do a whole lot of it in, astro in astronomy, for instance. But in this case, uh, a large bird of prey can differentiate to actually I don't like the way I read it can differentiate two objects as long as they are zero point, or actually I'll do it this way, uh, 3.0 times 10 to the negative fourth radians apart. So that, that might be called the angular eye resolution of, let's say, an eagle or a hawk or something like that, okay? Uh, I don't know what species uh, your book was quoting when they used this particular value. Uh, they, I'm certain that Gene Coley took the time to look it up or find it somewhere. So it's a decent figure. But what I want to know now is uh, A, what is that angle in degrees? And B, I should write that a different way. Uh, and B, how close can two objects be for the bird? to see them as two objects if the bird is 100 meters above. So in other words, when the when the bird is flying 100 meters uh, up above the ground, how far apart must two objects be for it to recognize that, oh, that's two objects, not one. So we'll go with that. Here we go. Solution. So we'll start off with part A, as soon as I do my you know necessary uh, erasure that I have to do every time, uh, I'm going to say... 3.0 times 10 to the negative fourth radians. And now I'm going to multiply that by a fraction. Again, I'll put it over one. 
the fraction I'm going to use is going to be this radian right here can be canceled or uh, can be canceled out by writing two pi. Well, actually, I'll use the other method since it's a little bit less cumbersome, not a whole lot, but still, I can say pi radians is equal to 180 degrees. And then you see, of course, that the radian cancels out with the radian, and I'll get three e to the negative four. Uh, I'm going to multiply that by 180, and then I'm going to divide it by uh, by 3.14159. I didn't need parentheses because I'm not writing the two there. And when I get this, I get when I do this, I get zero point. Oops, wrong color. So I don't know why this one's popped up, but anyways, it's 0 0.017. And technically I use two sig figs, so that's really all I should have, but I could call it 172 degrees. By the way, if you multiply that by 60, it'll give you arc minutes. So I'm going to do that too and say time 60. And that gives me... 1.03, and I'll just remind you up here that this is arc, and actually I'm supposed to do one mark, not two. I'll fix that in a second. Arc minutes. So ignore the double mark that I used and just use the single mark. So that digit wasn't there, and I have that like that. Uh, by the way, you could also make this an arc seconds by uh, multiplying that by 60 again, which gives me 61.9. And this time, it would be arc seconds. And that does have a double mark. So I'll put here and just write arc seconds. Okay, so that's some other measures you can use, but that really is our answer. Anybody have any questions about that? Okay, that should be pretty straightforward. Hopefully it's no problems. Now, the other part, what we're going to do is we're going to imagine the eagle Okay, uh, let's say the eagle's eye is looking down like this. And what we have is an object down here, or let's say two objects down here. And let's say one of them is this plus symbol. Okay, which sort of looks like an X. And the other one is this uh, dollar sign. Okay. Okay. So the distance between them uh, is really what we're trying to find. And if you call this angle theta, which is what I'll call that angle right there, okay? If we do that, and let me make that a little cleaner because it might not look so good. If you call that angle theta, then you know that the arc length between these things, that little arc length S would be equal to R times theta, where R is really the distance along here. And that's also the distance of the other side, and it's the distance down to the middle of the arc. Now, what the argument I'm going to make is that this angle is really, really small. So if you consider the chord length, which would be this, whoa, Nelly, there it goes again, my obligatory erasure, then that chord length right there is approximately equal to the arc length. So I'm going to say S equals arc length is approximately equal to the chord length, C-H-O-R-D length. 
And the quarter length is really what we want to know because we want to know how far apart they are, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to find the arc length and assume that's essentially the same thing. So here we go. We'll say uh, S is approximately equal to, uh, let's say, C, the cord length. Well, actually, I should say it a different way. I'm going to do that. Hold on a second. Let's say the cord length C is approximately equal to the arc length S, which does equal R, which is 100 meters times the, the radians, because it actually has to be in radians here to use that equation. That's 3.0 times 10 to the negative fourth radians. So you see that when you multiply this, we get 3.0 times 10 to the negative two, and the unit comes out to be median uh, meters times radians. But again, this is one of those cases where it's really helpful just to erase the radians, and that's what we're going to do. Uh, so what we can say is the answer is going to be about 0 0.030 meters which is on the order of 3.0 centimeters. So imagine that at some, you know, 360 feet above the ground or so, the bird of prey can actually tell uh, if there's two objects, as long as they're separated by a distance as small as three centimeters, which is about that. So that's, that's pretty impressive. Uh, you could also, of course, say that it can see something that's three centimeters in uh, length or width or whatever. So you can also say it that way. Anybody have any questions on that? Okay. So that was our second example, say. Now, uh, what we want to do now is I wanted to show you some examples. Uh, by the way, I should also tell you that this method where we're using arc length is about the same as cord length. We use that exclusively in astronomy. Uh, for instance, one of the tricks that astronomers pulled at one point uh, to measure distance, which is really the hardest thing you can do in astronomy, was they looked at all around our galaxy and found these certain types of clusters of stars. And these particular types of clusters of stars are really big and they're in a very specific part of our, uh, our galaxy. And we measured them because they're close enough where we could do so. And what we did was we said, well, uh, just statistically speaking that this region of the universe is not special compared to any other region of the universe. So I suspect that the largest one of these types of clusters would be about the same size as the largest one of these types of clusters in any other galaxy, uh, especially if you're sticking with, you know, spiraled or barred spiral galaxies like our galaxy is. So what they do is they find a the biggest barred spiral, or excuse me, the biggest uh, cluster like that one around any particular galaxy they want to know the distance to, they find that, they assume it's going to be exactly uh, that size as, as we had for the one we found near the Milky Way. And therefore, you have the S, which is really a chord length, but we're going to use it as S, the arc length. We'll say that's the arc length, and then R is the distance away. So all we have to do is measure the angle and divide that angle into the arc length that we chose, and that'll give us a distance away. So that's that's some of the ways that we end up using uh, this particular technique over and over again. We do it uh, if we want to measure, for instance, the diameter of our moon. If we want to measure the diameter of our sun, uh, we can use the angular measure and then assume that S equals R times theta gives us the chord length, which would be the diameter of the moon or the diameter of the sun. So. All right. 
So another question you might ask, and this is a little bit more uh, abstract, if you will. So uh, if you think about a carousel, so let's look at a carousel from above. I'm going to say, okay, here's a carousel. Supposed to be a circle, of course. And let's say this carousel is rotating. Whoa, I forgot I hadn't changed it back to the regular drawing. Let's say the carousel is rotating this way. And let's say this is the center of the circle. And let's say right here is a horse. And let's say that distance is L from here to the horse, OK? And then let's say there's another animal right here. And let's say its distance is L over 2. If this thing is rotating at an angular speed of omega and a linear speed v, well, actually, let's not do that. Let's, uh, let's say which one of these will be going faster. So that's a horse and the other one's a lion, say. So on this merry-go-round, which will have the highest linear velocity v part b which will have the highest angular velocity and that's omega so uh to be honest with you really we we need uh to have some understanding of answer b before we can do answer a but can anybody tell me answer a Let me turn on my chat in case anybody wrote something there. Yes, Micah, it is the horse. That's correct. Uh, so uh, A horse is fastest. That's the answer. So in order to make some sense of that, let's go ahead and answer B, and then I'll get back and uh, give you a, a better explanation. So how about answer B? Which one goes uh, through more degrees per second or revolutions per second or radians per minute or whatever? Which one of those, the horse or the lion, or neither? It's the same. It's the same. Very good. Okay, so that's the key point, and that's sort of why I was telling you about rigid bodies to begin with, because the uh, uh, these are the same. Because uh, this merry-go-round is a rigid body, and of course it has a, uh, li uh, a lion and a horse attached to it, and therefore they're not they're part of the rigid body, so they're not moving either. Uh, we could, in principle, still allow them to go up and down because that's completely perpendicular to our motion. So uh, at least in terms of left, right, 
and forward and backwards, uh, that wouldn't affect it at all, even even though it's technically not re not a rigid body at that point. But what you realize is if the let's say if the lion and horse were along this line, they don't one doesn't run in front of the other because if it were to, for instance, turn whoa now they oh I just switched something up here. Now, if it was, for instance, to turn all the way around to here, then what you would find is uh, wrong color there. Uh, what you would find is now the lion is here and now the horse is there. And that's, like I said, part of the calculation of it being a rigid body. Uh, you could treat those as if they're separate molecules and the fact that their distance between them couldn't change is really enough because if if this little horse just went slightly faster on an angular scale than the lion, then uh, the distance from this dot to this dot, a dot in the middle of the lion to a dot in the middle of the horse, that would actually change. Uh, so we know that they have to rotate at the same rate in that way. And what we're really looking at here is V for the horse is equal to L times omega. And notice I didn't uh, I didn't subscript the omega because those are the same. Omega horse is equal to omega lion. But when I go to calculate V lion, I get L over two times omega. So you see. Uh, the velocity of the horse is twice the velocity of the lion. Any questions on that? All right, so hopefully that helps to some extent. Anybody have any questions? All right, so let's work another example. Uh, that one I'll call example three. And let's call this one example four. So uh, a carousel accelerates at 0 0.0800 radians per second every second for 10.0 seconds. However, it was initially at rest. A, what I'd like to know is uh, what is the what is the angular velocity omega at t equals 8.0, or excuse me, t equals 10.0 seconds. B, what is the linear velocity of a child on a horse that is 6.0 meters from the axle. And I mean the axle of the the axle of the carousel. Let's see part C. 
for C, I want to know uh, the tangential or linear acceleration. And D, I want to know the radial acceleration, AR. Okay. And I'll explain all that as we're going. And then finally, for part E, I would like to know the total acceleration, A total, which is equal to A tangential plus A radial, and therefore A total has a magnitude given by A tan squared plus a r squared square root okay so i just heard what sounded like someone accidentally or possibly on purpose left i want to remind you guys that uh i did set up your online test I uh, set up your uh, midterm, your second midterm, so y'all can take it at home, so you don't have to go to the lab tonight. Hopefully, you got that before you drove. I uh, tried to send it out this morning kind of early. Hopefully, that, that's the case. I told uh, Ms. Raskovic that she need not be there, and uh, everybody was supposed to email me if they had any problems where they couldn't do it that way. I didn't receive any emails, so I assume everybody's okay, but if you're not, just let me know right after class uh, in this forum. And I'll talk to you and figure out something to do. So anyway, it's just in case anybody's leaving to go to lab. They don't have lab tonight. You're just doing this. All right. So let's go on with part A. Here it goes again. So part A. It wants to know the angular velocity. Well, uh, in this case, you actually got an acceleration. So we could use, for instance, one of our equations. In this case, the acceleration is, in fact, constant. It's 0 0.08 radians per second per second. So I could actually say, well, the equation that I would have used with something like this when I was doing linear motion would have been V equals V0 plus alpha T. So I'm going to use omega equals omega 0 plus alpha T where I'm going to use essentially the average acceleration, but in this case, it appears to be a constant acceleration. So I'm going to say omega is equal to zero because it's initially at rest. So omega is equal to zero plus 0 0.080 radians per second per second times 10.0 seconds. And that's going to give us omega at 10.0 seconds is equal to 0 0.08 times 10 is 0 0.80 radians per second. Hopefully that makes sense to everyone. No questions? Anyone? Anyone? Okay, so for part B, we want to know what's the linear velocity of a child on the horse at six meters from the axle. That is like just glaring uh, example of, hey, you're supposed to use V equals R omega here. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to say V, the linear, is equal to R times omega. And the fact that I gave you the distance uh, between the axle and the lion, for instance, or the axle and the horse in this case, uh, you can assume that's the perpendicular distance. So we're just going to go with that and say V is equal to 6.0 meters times omega, which we said was 0 0.80 radians per second. So when I multiply 6 times 0 0.8, we all know that that's 4.8. Now, in this case, it's media, meters per second times radians, but again, we can just throw away the radians and we'll be done. So that's the velocity at uh, the linear velocity at 10 seconds. And therefore, it's part B and this is part A. 
Any questions on that part? Does that make sense to everyone? Okay, so for part C, we want to know the tangential acceleration. So uh, when I said, uh, let's see, this is part C. When I said uh, S equals R times theta gives me V is equal to R times omega, and then took the derivative of that and got A is equal to R times alpha. This alpha right here is your, uh, well, I should say this. That's your angular acceleration, radians per second per second or degrees per second per second. But this one right here is A tan. In other words, this is the acceleration you'd have if you're driving in a circle and you hit the accelerator, so you push the pedal down a little bit further, your velocity would go up. Uh, the amount of change in velocity per unit time would be how much that uh, velocity went up tangential to your path, so they call it A tan. So that's what I'm trying to get at is that would be A tan, and it's tangential to the, the path that you're going along, which in cases of a circle is, is literally uh, it's perpendicular to radial. And then the other one is the radial acceleration, and therefore it's perpendicular. That's why I get to use the Pythagorean theorem uh, and stuff like that. So we can go ahead and calculate this now. And I am going to say that A is equal to R times alpha. And that's going to give me R is 6.0 meters. And then alpha we found was 0 0.080 radians per second every second. And in this case, you're going to get 6 times 0 0.08, which is going to be 0 0.48. 0 0.48. And this will become uh, meters per second per second, again, dropping the uh, radians. So that's the answer to C. Uh, and obviously, this would be speeding up. So if the object is going clockwise and around the circle, then this would point in the clockwise direction at each little tangential point on the circle. And then part D, we can do that now. So part D, they want to know uh, the radial part. Well, the radial part is what we recognize A radial is actually equal to V squared over R. And uh, that's convenient, but that would require me to use V, which I calculated, and it's best not to use calculated quantities. So I'm going to use the expression V equals R omega, this guy right here, and I'm going to put it in there. And what I'm going to get is R squared omega squared over R which becomes just R omega squared. So now I can calculate the radial acceleration. That radial acceleration will be 6.0 meters times 0 0.080 radians per second per second squared. So... Yeah, that looks fine. Meters per second per second. Oh, excuse me. Oops. I did the same mistake that I, I almost did the same mistake that I made in class today. Everybody notice I just accidentally put the acceleration in there instead of the omega. That's not good. Luckily, I was paying attention to the units because that set me straight. <laughs> I was like, this, there's no way I'm going to have seconds to the fourth in the bottom. This is horrible. Okay, so the omega that we calculated, notice I am still using a calculated quantity despite what I just said to you. <laughs> but anyways, the omega that we had was 0 0.80. So I'm going to say 0 0.80 radians per second is the omega. And then that quantity is going to be squared. So that's uh, 8 over 10 times 8 over 10 would be 64 over 100. So that'd be 0.64, and then we multiply that by 6, 
that gives me 30 or 3.6 something. So let's do six times 0.8 squared. And that gives me 3.84. And again, this is a case where we have meters per second squared times radians. I'm going to write it as meters per second per second for the same reason I, I always said that uh, about G, and that being 9.8 meters per second every second. I'm still using that same terminology here. And this is D. Okay. This quantity is A radial, and this quantity is A tangential. So just to give you a feel for what we're talking about, let's go ahead and draw another circle. And let's say... Here's my circle. Uh, let's say the object is actually going around, the carousel, of course, is actually going around this way. So it's actually spinning in a clockwise direction. If we take right here, what we'd have is the velocity vector pointing this way. OK. Uh, what we'd also have, though, is in order for us to have any kind of circular motion, there has to be a radial acceleration given by V squared over R, which is that way. But if we also chose to speed up or slow down, we would get an acceleration this way too, and that would be A tan. So that's why uh, it is what it is. And we can now go ahead and write down that the magnitude of A total is going to be A is equal to the square root of 3.84, that's one extra sig fig, by the way, 3.84 meters per second every second. That quantity is going to be squared plus 0 0.48 meters per second every second, which is also going to be squared. And we would get, in fact, 3.84 squared plus 0.48 squared gives me the square root of 14.967. Actually, it's 976. And that's meters squared per second to the four. Okay. And that gives me, once I take the square root, that gives me 3.86. And actually, that's technically 3.87. I have to round it up because the next digit was 9. So that's 3.87 meters per second every second. And that's the total acceleration, which is part F, or part E, excuse me. So anybody have any questions about that part? All right, you could also, by the way, uh, you could actually give that a vector quantity, but I think what you, hopefully what you'd see from trying to do that is you'd see that at this particular point where I drew the diagram, the AR would point in the negative X direction, assuming I made right positive X and up positive Y, and A tan would point in the negative Y direction, uh, but when you move down to, for instance, this spot, then all of a sudden you're going to get A tan is in the negative X direction and A R is in the positive Y direction. So it's going to change as a function of time. But the main thing is you could totally just realize that they're always going to be perpendicular. That's the, the main thing that I was getting at when I tried to draw them for you uh, and why I showed you uh, basically the diagram. So hopefully that helped. Anybody have any questions on that? Okay, so the normal stuff that we do, remember I told you how you could take the A of T and I could integrate that if I know, you know, something about the velocity at some time, then I could actually integrate A of T 
And of course that would produce a constant. And then I could take the data that they gave me about V as a function of time for a particular point in time. And that would allow me to eliminate the unknown constant. And then I'd have V as a function of time. Then again, if I also had X at some time, uh, sp a specific value of X at some specific value of time, I could integrate V of T and get X of T and again, re remove the integration constant. So that kind of stuff is still going on. Uh, you can see, for example, uh, example 10.5 in the book. So I'll say uh, C example 10-5, just because I don't feel it's hard enough for me to need to cover it for you, but it's definitely uh the quote unquote the easy type of problem that you should know how to be able to solve and i'm afraid that if you just assumed you could solve it because quote unquote mr younger said it was easy that might not pan out so good so anyways uh, i will also tell you that we can treat these angular quantities as vectors in some sense in other words we can give them directions but that's why i didn't actually use very much vector stuff on this was specifically because there's some technical issues with regards to vectors. So uh, if you had, for instance, let's imagine I had a circular disk that's spinning like this. And let's assume that it's actually spinning in this way. Well, you might say that I could represent this angular velocity with a vector there. But if you told me that, I would say, well, why not use this vector? Because it seems like that vector is just as good as the one you're talking about. And then you might come back and say, well, let's not use that. Let's use this vector. And then I'd say, well, what about this vector? Wouldn't that work well? And in fact, you keep doing that and you would get an infinity of vectors all of which are equally good or slash equally bad at defining a vector to represent the angular velocity. But if we flip it a little bit and say, okay, maybe I don't want that because there's an infinity of vectors inside of a plane, maybe it would be best not to use the vectors in the rotational plane but use vectors that are parallel or something like that to the axis. In other words, perpendicular to this plane. You could do that. And in fact, that's what I'm going to do. So, well, that looked out, worked out really nicely, didn't it? Okay. I was trying to repair my circular disk, which looks elliptical because it's at an angle. OK, so if you decide to regroup and say, well, let's use, uh, for instance, this vector. Then some smart aleck might come along and say, well, why not use this vector? And uh, there's really not necessarily a good reason for not using it. But I will tell you that you can always have a agreement, sort of like the social contract we have uh, with other humans that they're going to go to the grocery store and they're going to put up their uh, shopping cart. <laughs> and, and I know people aren't keeping up with that, but that's that's the nature of it. So the same thing could happen here. So what we've done is we decided on a very specific thing. Uh, we will use one of these vectors, but we're going to use a right hand rule. And the right hand rule will be when I wrap my fingers uh, to curl in the direction that the disc is spinning, then my right thumb will point in the direction that will call the omega vector. So I'm going to now say that the omega vector is actually that guy. But I will tell you that technically it is a pseudo vector. 
Okay, now don't get into the practice that we've all managed to grow up with, which is basically when you're reading something and you run into a word you don't know, you just keep reading and just sort of ignore it. Okay, don't do that. Uh, because, for instance, I've had two neat stories here to tell you. One was a friend of uh, a mutual friend of mine and another guy uh, once was arguing to us that astronomy was, uh, excuse me, astrology is a science and we said no it's it's not a science it, it sort of failed the scientific revolution and stuff like that so it's not really a science and they said no no it's definitely a science i looked it up and everything and they pull out the dictionary and show me and it said uh, it's a pseudoscience and they said well see it's a, it's a science but they were just ignoring the fact that the word on the front of it was pseudo so they just didn't know what the word pseudo meant and they just sort of ignored it and that that's fine uh but you got to be better than that and start looking up stuff. So anyways, that's what this is, a pseudo vector. Uh, I will tell you that that uh, another person that me and this friend knew, uh, I had a friend that was working as a flight steward. And uh, like me, she grew up in the South. So like when I grew up in the South, I literally had never met a person that was Jewish until I got to grad school, until I got to college. Uh, at least I didn't know I had met any Jewish person until then. And then... <laughs> And then uh, this poor girl who grew up like me, not knowing anything about Judaism, uh, was serving meals on her aircraft. And people would say, is this meal kosher? And she said, yeah, because she just thought kosher meant like, fine, it's good or something like that. So she's been uh, terrorizing poor Jewish people for uh, for several years before she finally learned that kosher meant that it was a certain way of preparing food. And, you know, certain people only ate that. So anyways, definitely don't do that. But this is one of those cases. Omega is what's called a pseudo vector. And your book points out that if you take, for instance, the pseudo vector, and let's say we imagine a disk rotating this way. Okay. I'm going to say the disk is, in fact, rotating. This, whoops. I'm going to say it's rotating, and I don't like what just happened there. I'm going to say the front is rotating towards uh, uh, or down, and the back is rotating up. And then I'm going to put a little mirror back here. And, of course, the one time I want a nice straight line, it's not going to show you a nice straight line. And according to the right-hand rule, the vector for this particular angular velocity should be that, okay? But now if we look at the reflection of this vector in the mirror, what we'll find... is this vector has that side going up, okay, and has this side going down, like that. And therefore, the right-hand rule would suggest that omega is that way. Well, when you have a reflection in a mirror that's the opposite of what you got for the real thing, then that's a pseudo vector. So that's what's going on here. This is a pseudo vector. And in fact, all vectors that come from cross products turn out to be pseudo vectors as well. Okay, so for instance, when we use torque is equal to R cross F, that's a pseudo vector. Now, that doesn't mean pseudo vectors aren't useful. That just means you got to be careful if you're using them because they don't just uh, translate from one coordinate system to the other nicely. So uh, you, you have to be very careful about that kind of stuff. There's, there's a general approximation uh, that we use. As, it's called a wedge product instead of a cross product, and, and that does a little better job. But either way, 
uh, we'll learn about the uh, calculating the torque later. I will just tell you that, in fact, torque is given by R cross F. And uh, just think about what you do if you're riding a bicycle. Uh, under what conditions can you get the most thrust in one pedal stroke? So you're going to try to take off from a standstill. You're going to put your cranks and your pedals in very specific places, and you're going to put your body in a very specific place in a very specific angle or something like that to try to take off what things are you doing there? And then if you had that bike versus a bike with a different set of pedals and cranks and stuff like that, what could you do to increase that torque? I want you to be thinking about that because I'm going to use that argument to make a, a discussion of what the torque should depend on. And then I'm going to show you the mathematical formulas and start using uh, basically the equivalent of Newton's second law to solve, for instance, uh, an Atwood machine with a pulley that has friction and mass. Okay, so you guys are free to go. Uh, we just finished. It's uh, 641, oh, just turned 642. So you're free to go. Thanks for coming, everybody. And I'll wait for the last one to leave in case anybody has any questions. I've got a question. Mm -hmm. So I, I noticed that I was like, I was behind on some work in this class. So I went to go do some, right? Right. I figured better late than never. <laughs> yes. But when I took practice test 07, chapters 11 and 12 and 13, NAS 30, 130, uh -huh. I was hit with some very questionable questions. I don't even know how that's showing. That's actually from an entirely different class. I've never transferred it to to this course. I don't know how it even got there. Uh, that's really weird. So I, I <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, and okay. what, what happens with our practice tests is they disappear uh, as soon as the test day comes because I give people extra credit for doing them by before they take the test. So they disappear as soon. If you if you want to do that kind of catch up, go to the section in the book. I mean, in uh, Canvas that says uh, chapter practice. And you can do those, or you oh. can do practices. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much about that. <laughs> no problem, Josh. Sorry, sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, well, I was a little confused. It, by the way. <laughs> I have no idea how you even found that. So, if you could, if anybody could tell me how he found that, that'd be awesome. Because I know y'all are using some ways in Canvas that I I haven't figured out yet. But there, there's obviously ways of seeing things other than just going to the modules, which is what I normally do. Anybody else have any questions? Well, I went to, um, Go ahead, Josh. <laughs> I went to grades. That's how I found it. Uh, okay, gotcha. That makes sense. It was, it was a late grade. Most people go too. Yeah, I, I never, I mean, I hardly even ever click on the grades link, but yeah, that would make sense. It'd have all the assignments in there. I'll try to get rid of it. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> okay, thank you. You're welcome. Good luck on your exams, everybody. I hope y'all kick butt. Anybody else? Uh, yes, you can uh, wait a little while if you want to take it. I'll just ask everybody, do not talk to each other about it. I've got at least one person that's going to have to take it late. So uh, there could be some overlap between the version they get and the version that you get. So you're giving other people really good advantages in, in, if that happens. So just don't talk to other people. But yeah, uh, it's going to disappear tonight at like midnight. But uh, or, no, it'll disappear tomorrow. So yeah, I definitely get it done by midnight. So have a good one. <laughs>